Hi, I'm Amanda Krugliak, and I am part of the Ann Arbor Film Festival. I'm a volunteer and participant, and here today with Marku Hakala and Mari Kaki to discuss a Giant's Kettle, which is this extraordinary film as part of the film festival. So I'm so excited that I get to be here. Hello, you two. Hello. Hello, thank you. Thank Hi, you. how are you? Good, good. Great. So what is the time difference there? Is it f how many hours ahead are you? I'm not actually sure, but it's uh, <laughs> o'clock in the evening. So what's your yeah. time at the moment? Yeah, you have an advantage over me to make your day, you know, let's see. Or I, I still have five hours yeah. to make my day productive, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm sure. so glad to be with you and talk about this amazing film, which I, I just love. And there's so many things that come to mind uh, as an arts curator watching it for me. You know, I look at it as this piece of art visually in addition to being, um, you know, having this a sequence of potential narrative or as a film that it's truly like a series of paintings. So I'm thrilled to be able to uh, talk to you today. Um, I thought maybe we could start before we get to that part, which feels self-serving, um, I wondered if you might just talk about the concept of the film and your collaboration and how the two of you have come to work together and just a history as collaborators. Uh, concept of the film, <laughs> what should we say? Uh... Um, well, um, it's, a, it's a script I wrote uh, 10 years ago and it was intended to be a um, um, short film. Uh, but I uh, then uh, put the script aside because it um, it was too complicated to do. And um, well, my uh, history with Mari, we've been doing all kinds of collaboration with regards to the situation on our planet and uh, and all kind of um, trying to find an art project uh, to do together. Uh, and we kept kind of we kept on coming to this script that we he had put aside, and we kept on kind of like being uh, interested about it and and thinking that this should be this should be done, but we I mean it felt really impossible because there there were so many it was um it was we we didn't have any experience almost in the filmmaking while starting this, and actually we are not. Uh, really even artists but we are coming from totally different kinds of fields of work so so it felt like a two big projects to start with but still we kind of like all the time ended up with the same script and thinking about it. and then we just decided okay since we can't don't seem to be able to do anything else let's do this and uh yeah so we decided that okay it's a short film and uh I was struggling with the idea that it's going to probably take one and a half years to do this. So, and then we decided that, okay, we should do it. Well, in the end, it took six years and we had to put everything aside. Yeah. <laughs> but, Luckily, we didn't know when we started yeah. how long it's going to take yeah. for us. Yeah. And Marku, can you move a little closer to, um, yeah. just because mm -hmm. I can't, no, now you have to move a little closer to him. There you yeah. go. I just couldn't see both of you. Yeah. Um, so t tell me again. So you're saying you were you were not filmmakers when this project began, that you have a different um, areas of work. Yeah. Can you talk w more about how how you each came to it and, and in and what you're referring to? Um, like what fuel what sort of. Yeah, well, uh, my background is in computer science, actually, and and um, I was first in the, uh, uh, in academia as a researcher, and then I had my own company. Um, but um, I think art was something that um, uh, I was supposed to do. Yeah. But I was um, um, it was I went off course for fifteen years, <laughs> uh, so to say. And um, then uh, at some point, I, I realized that. Uh, this is something that uh, is pulling pulling me. So 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 huh? I need to do yeah. this. And I work as a 
in Finland we call this a professional supervisor. I don't know if you have the name for that, but I help people uh, kind of like doing their work and think about and 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 reflecting on their work. And I have been interested about uh, uh, helping creative people to do their work. So that's kind of like I was trying to help Marku to uh, and also kind of like got it was more like a friendship and cooperation not me working as a in my profession but more like getting intrigued about this this project and i feel that more than we that we didn't really decide that we need to do this film but the film decided that it needs us for we feel kind of like there is a third kind of party in this collaboration mm -hmm. not just two of us but the film itself that wanted to be made yeah it feels that way i mean yeah. I, I can understand now talking to you both the way that you support you nurtured each other's idea and there's something emotionally about this film that maybe we can try to get to that there's a a beautiful way that you know it ex, it's always expanding and contracting it feels very organic to me the way the film is in this state of becoming and um, it's it's quite tender, right, to watch this uh, microcosm that then becomes a macrocosm, and it's a, almost like a, a looking into a snow globe at times, right? Like there's a contained world, and then the possibility of of worlds. So um, I think that likely comes from this relationship, and uh, and you feeling that this film be, is its own, you know, has its own um, persona in a way that you're, yeah. you're collaborating, right, with the yeah. film to tell you what to do. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we, we felt that we, we had to be faithful, faithful to the source. And uh, we, we feel like uh, we are servants to that. So, Can you talk a little bit more, let's say, returning back to this, uh, to this impression I have, which may or may not be right but that the work for me is really painterly, like the way you've sequenced it and each of these segments could be just a still painting mm -hmm. that then becomes uh, activated or inhabited. And uh, even the black use of the black and white and the, the composition for me feels as if it's, it, it's quite painterly. I don't know if you have anything a lot of people that have way. said that. A lot of people have said that, and it's it's true. Uh, of, uh, I myself have have become blind to the photos, so I I can't see them in the same way that other people see them. But um, we have been thinking of of um, of some kind of gallery exhibition that it, this would work as a gallery exhibition, especially with this kind of directional speakers, because I think. Uh, the sound plays a very important role, but it 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 uh, shouldn't pollute the whole space. So if you have a directional speaker, and if you step in front of this painting, you get immersed in the sound field of that painting, and then you can, f at your own pace, go through the story. That's uh, one way that this good film could could be presented. Yeah, absolutely. And you talking about your background and thinking about new media and technology in how a film like this, let's say it was presented in such a way, you could imagine these frames on a screen that appear to be inanimate, but then begin to come to life with these small movements. That it, there's a way that the, the technology that you are interested in and are working with allows for this other dimension that in in the past, you know, it you wouldn't have had that uh, kind of, um, capacity for something really to to unfurl in that way visually so it's really really fascinating right um, and, you... and, 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 and uh, we wouldn't have even had the technology to do these people with uh, just two people i mean there was a sound guy that helped us and we had an extra t to do the um, mm. costume design but it's basically a crew of four people so so it, it it hadn't couldn't have been possible without the technology we have now right can you discuss a little bit the set, the settings, at, like the the staging of this, and how you made these, these, uh, 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 in situ, these these small worlds, visually? 
Can you just discuss, is it in a sound stage or was it, how, how was it so contained and controlled? Well, of course, if you if you embark on a project like this, I mean, the the best way uh, would be to first have the locations. I mean, if you have have the budget we have, and uh, first have the locations, and then build up a story on that. But we we already had the script and very uh, concrete idea what these um, places sh um, should look like, and there weren't these kind of locations available. So we had to um, rent a studio space with the green screen equipment and stuff like that, and uh, most of the stuff is done on computers after the after the fact. I see. I see. Um, and also we had to, like, when you said it's uh, painter, painterly-like, the pictures, uh, we had to kind of like, um, some of them were too realistic, so we had to make uh, pictures look more... Can yeah. you explain a little yeah, bit? Yeah, if you we, if we have an outdoor scene, for example, and most of the stuff is shot indoors, we instead of trying to make this computer-generated stuff to look realistic we need to make the realistic parts look fake so yeah. that they blend together yeah. then it's convincing to, for the yeah. audience so and, I, I think that that also adds up to this kind of like this feeling of of looking into this other world inside a glass or something like that there is this uh feeling of uh i don't know smooth it's a voyeur, a voyeur like it's a bit of a voyeurism right yeah you feel like yeah. you're very much looking into it and even at a certain point, you know, this I, the the title Giant's Kettle, which is, refers to this glacier, right? A, it's a, a like a, a cavern, yeah. In the ground. Oh. So it has a really literal meaning, but at the same time, it alludes to this fairy tale voyeuristic giant who's watching these small people, you know, go yeah. through these yeah. go through these yeah. uh, you it's know the interesting routines that of their life. Angle. It's interesting that you bring up this angle, this voyeurism angle, because uh, when we were thinking about putting this on the gallery as a big screens, uh, we experimented with different screen sizes. And uh, one of the screen sizes actually that we came up with was mobile phone. But just peeking, but, but peeking, through, uh... peeking through a hole. And it was really captivating to look at these tiny little people going there <laughs> inside the screen. Uh, it, it, it was amazing. I, I don't know what happened. Because yeah. it, for a film like this, you, you would consider it in its best looking from a big screen. But it works also from a very tiny screen. No, but I think that's part of the magic as a viewer looking at this film. Is, is you do always go back and forth between this small world that you know, you're, and then looking down upon it, and you can't help but think about your own life, right? In mm -hmm. this, in this world that you're creating, how we move through our world with a sense of agency, and then feel this, you know, complete disenchantment in recognizing what is so now far beyond our control, right? Which I don't know if you want to speak more about your, you know, your feeling of urgency and insistence in making this in response to uh, a time when there is so much already done that can't be undone or thinking about the environment or your interest in in environmentalism. I think you alluded to that and I don't know if you'd like to say more about that or if that's if that's a correct connection or not. I, I think that's an interesting interpretation and um, and uh, there's something in that because I, I uh, the film it has a story in uh, it's a simple story in in, in a way, uh, but I think more important than that is um, the kind of feeling it 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 um, uh, transmits, and I think that's a feeling um, to live in this world. Uh, it somehow, somehow, this kind of feeling of um, there must be more mm -hmm. to it yeah. that that underlies everything, that it's bubbling there in everything. There must be more, mm -hmm. but we have rationalized it. Mm -hmm. We have squeezed out ev every life, life <laughs> of this yeah. world, yeah. and this is what is left. 
and we're left <laughs> with this world that it's like running like a machine and we have start thinking ourselves as parts of the machine and we are solving problems and it's not going to we are not going to by solving problems we are not going to solve anything yeah. I, we have this mindset that we need to solve problems but for the past few hundred years we have focused on solving problems and we've generated more and more problems than we've ever had and bigger problems so it's this rational mindset it's probably not going i mean uh, the definition of being an idiot is that you something doesn't work and you continue doing that yeah and you really you know when you think about how time relates to the film this repetition and how you have this sense of everything and nothing you know everything and nothing all at once and the way that uh time moves forward and and everybody still is standing still and then the only you know there's this faint hopefulness though in the you know as the film uh concludes or at least ends as far as the beginning and end of the film um just the slightest hopefulness right of the end of the child reaching into this abyss you know and and the generosity of that uh you know of that a helping you know the human relationship that then has the potential or alludes to maybe something that could be a shift or yeah. a change yeah um and, but and the environment of that, you know, you're always, I, I, it feels like you're always setting up this fairy tale. You know, there's like a reference to fairy tale, to an idealism, and then also to this containment and reality and frustration. Yeah. yeah. Those and, two things, yeah. Yeah, and and we think that um, we also kind of like uh, the there are many interpretations that we ourselves also have for this film, but one key seems to be that the, the female main character of the film, the way she is um, like um, able to meet the giant and, uh, and kind of like be face to face with, with her uh, perhaps fears or needs or wants, wants and, and desires that is the kind of like the key key to the liberation of the kind of like the what happens in the end and at the same time she is um she's also kind of like um finding her perhaps i don't know rayat like the limits, limits or or limits of her or i'm not i don't know yeah yeah, I, I don't know if you get anything out of this, what I'm saying. Oh, but... I do, I do. I hadn't yeah. thought about her, her role. Specifically. Yeah, and also she has, uh, at many points of the film, she has like this, uh, she tries to kind of like break free somehow, but it's suffocated. And uh, and uh, and uh, so I, I kind of like think that that is the, the, for me at least it's the something that i follow every time that i see the film so it's well, her, so her story and her kind of like the something that is alive in her but also i think that the man is also uh he is very i don't know i feel feel for him i mean like he's very sympathetic and he's trying very hard to be this uh good man and do everything right and and be heroic and 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 i think he, he think of him as a kind of like this um almost like a, a funny or comedy yeah. character yeah. or something like that and it's it's in his trying so hard to um be a good man and and fulfill his role and and uh he's at the same time, um, kind of like vulnerable. People, yeah. Other men are looking at him all the time, and he's kind of like ashamed of the finding the uh, uh, the JoJo or what, what's the word? Mm, JoJo, JoJo <laughs> from the floor and things like that, and he's kind of like struggling to. So there is a playfulness in him too, which kind of like breaks free in the in the end of the film but it, he has to kind of like be very careful not to 
uh, kind of like let it be seen or things like that. So, yeah, I think you definitely get that. I mean, I I feel tremendous sympathy yeah. for the for the people in the you know in the film and um, just how hard they're trying, right? Um, maybe that's part of what's so tender and what we relate to, you know, that feeling of wanting the next time to to get it right. Or um, I couldn't help but think about the relationships and the remoteness. There's a certain remoteness um, in regards to their relationship, and yet you can really feel this <laughs> struggle to try to connect. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. it's, it's so poignant. Um, did you feel making this film in the in this particular period that we're in, you know, having gone through this time of isolationism, of, of being isolated, or just having a hard time connecting suddenly in a way that feels different? Has that influenced at all how the how the characters played out? Actually, the COVID happened uh, during the later stages, so so I think these. Um, theme of isolation uh it, it's goes beyond beyond that yeah uh, it's um i think it has has roots maybe in, even in um as we become individuals with our own egos and and therefore therefore cut ourselves from the world and from the others and uh, uh so I, I think our egos and working from the ego um it's directly corresponds to the way we operate as rational people so if we want to have uh, solutions to our world the solutions lie in us being able to transcend our egos and to be able to transcend our egos we need to transcend the rational thinking right so right. so and for us um and also kind of like be able to make the connections once again, like as a new person. <laughs> yeah, I mean, rationality is always confined. Every rationality is confined. If you transcend rationality, you are able to reconnect, but only after that. And by transcending, I mean not getting rid of rationality. We need that. I mean, there's a lot of good things that have come out of being, being able to think rationally. But to transcend that, to see that there's limitations, there's limits to rationality, and that must not rule us. In the world of giant schedule, rationality rules. Everything is subjected to rationality. Everything is looked through the rational eyes. And so for, ours, for us and for the whole project, uh, this was a stupid thing to do, this project, we <laughs> <laughs> career-wise. So in a sense, we try to live as with preach, it, it was not a rational thing to do. We had to listen what is needed from us. Yeah. And, and this was what was needed us at this point of time. Do you feel that the young boy in the film, the children, I mean, is that where the hope is in this sort of way that they could represent something different or do it? Is it, is it as literal as that? Or was it, talk about this, this shift that happens where, where this young child comes into play and, you know, there, be, there seems to be a, a shift in the film, perhaps, in, in the possibility of that child reaching for the, as an example, like reaching for the uh, calculator or the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the um, reaching for that, that on the desk. Yeah. Phone. Yeah, and, and now it becomes more playful. It's not just a function, right? That there's the just the ever so slight possibility that this there could be a return to this. As I keep coming back to this generosity, you know, to the extending of oneself in these small gestures in the film that really can change everything. Whether it's handing, you know, handing over something that's been lost or dropped or reaching for somebody else to be able to be free or um, even the moments of, uh, you know, explosive moments, like the argument between the two people. There's a, there's a way that there's a, you know, that's bringing them back to this place of being more human mm -hmm. to have the space to, to be disruptive or to 
unleash something that has otherwise been contained. I, I didn't know if you, you know, what, what, what is the hope? Where's the hopefulness in the end? Because it did feel hopeful to me yeah. in the end. And maybe yeah. it's just a certain humor. I'm not sure, but. Yeah. Uh, it's it's funny that we are actually uh, on the same side of uh, the table because our, we uh, didn't have a message when doing this film. We tried to be faithful to the sources. So we are, in the same way as you are, we are trying to interpret what is this all about. And it's so amazing to hear your observations about about the film. Oh yeah, that's that's that sounds so true. Um, so the well, the ending, I think. Um, there's Can no, I say something yeah, about yeah. that, like the child character? I mean, like I feel that the the the, uh, the the parents are unable to really make a connection or be be parents to this child because they have not met their their <laughs> inner child, the kind of like stupid frame for. But but they don't they they have all kinds of hints to this playfulness, uh, which they should be able to meet to be able to be to take care of this child yeah. to take care of the child's kind of like uh needs and they can't attend their needs to be creative and playful and and things like that so maybe that's why i mean like i think that the ending kind of like for me it means more like uh, this is how it could have been between the man and the woman uh all along they could have been uh they could have been able to meet each other uh, and and they could have been alive their whole lives but somehow they the world kind of like um took it away from them yeah so so in a sense the i think the hope is in a child but it's the child is kind of like everywhere little hints right. of the child is everywhere not just in that child character and i think you do get that feeling of perhaps that those being different versions of the man you know yeah. the older man and the younger man and the static scene when they're traveling and you know the possibility of what those relationships could be mm -hmm. um but maybe to me one of the you know the most I don't know what gives our life meaning is uh, uh, certainly when if if you've had also a child or some something that could presumably will continue on after you it's really coming to that realization of what I cannot you know of that feeling of not being able to be as fluid or change or make changes in a way that as a young person you feel like the world is vast you know, and as you get older, you feel like everything becomes narrower. And I think that there there is a way that that child figure speaks to that yeah. uh, sense of one's limitations have already been gone and also some future. Um, it, yeah. It's 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 moving, really, you know, all of these all of these nuances in the film. Yeah. You know, all of the ways you bring in these uh, uh, moments of cluster, of feeling uh, a lack of air or, you know, quite literal, visceral moments in the film. And also these incredibly philosophical moments where you're thinking about something beyond the, the small room, you know, becomes the whole universe. So it's yeah. really, really great. <laughs> Thank you. I, yeah. I think the... One thing about this film is also I I I think it's more um, it it's it can be read as metaphors or or uh, that um, kind of like um, that you need to interpret them and put something from you to the film. It's not I mean like the story is in itself kind of like it's there is nothing so. To, vague or, or difficult about it but I think that still the the you can't really get so much from the film if you're not able to put uh, your memories or or mm, kind of like um, imagination or, or things like that in the film and and I think that what we have seen so far people uh, tell us after the film that oh I really I remember that 
for example, a scent from some place, or mm -hmm. or I feel remembered something that felt like this um, from far away from their childhood or something like that. So it really kind of like elevates um, from people's memories and and things that they have uh, experienced in their lives, and they put those in the in the kind of like fill in the uh, fill the movie um, that or the film uh, with their own imagination and pictures and and things like that. So I think that what you say is absolutely true. That the way you've created it or structured it, even the fact that it's a narrative, but in fact it's more a series of fragments or sequences that you leave open spaces that we come to it in such a way that we make the meaning in these in these yeah. short stories that you offer uh, rather than it being a prescribed narrative in yeah. a more linear sense. Yeah, and also there is a, um, there is a black space uh, usually between the pictures. So it kind of like, I've, someone also said that it kind of like uh, brings uh, this um, other picture kind of like some kind of echo of the picture uh, keeps on going or or there is there is something else that fills the blackness it's not just empty so i think that that was a kind of like a also a key point when you uh, figure it out that this is how we should do it yeah, I think that it... there is there has to be a black yeah, black pause like a pause. I, I think it's um i i call it emotional after image yeah. Uh, you know, if, you, if you have a red uh, picture, then you see, uh, if you take it away, you will see green after that. Yes, the yes, same yes. way, if you, if you ha have been drawn into some emotion and then you, if you abruptly cut it, then yes. it has some kind of emotional after picture in you that, that's open to uh, uh, your experience. Yes. It, I, it makes me think of two things. It makes me think, in, you know, in music, how often there'll be a gesture after playing a harp or playing an instrument and the sound carries, you know, that there's a gesture that happens that allows the sound to carry. And those, those, uh, those pauses allow there to be this resonant, you know, something else happens in those, in those moments, almost like a drawing in space that is different than the, um, than the film. Um, and I wonder too, he uses the word wonder when it, I'm trying to get at wonder that I think it's like <laughs> there's the space for wonder that the, the film has so many opportunities to wonder. Mm. And I think that's such a beautiful, you know, beautiful thing to feel that there's the space for that and that there's the time for that and that the film allows us that. So, <laughs> yeah, that sounds wonderful actually yeah. yeah and we were lucky enough to have the uh, uh the the male lead of the film uh who has an internal clock that is so frustratingly slow that that, that, that we could use for the purpose <laughs> oh, right. of, the, of the film exactly exactly yeah. well i think that's all the time we have i'm pretty sure i'm sure you have other things to do today I still do my coffee, so. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you for this. Um, uh, you really gave a lot of uh, very beautiful interpretations of, yeah. of the film. Something well, to think about. I just loved it. In fact, I'm going to go watch it again now that we've had our talk. I can enjoy it um, <laughs> again. But uh, thank you so much. You know, it's it's a it's always a gift to me to be able to watch these films and a film like this. And, and just also meet you, even if it's a uh, long distance like this. So thank you. Thank you, Thank Amanda. Thank you so much. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.